That works. That's good. Yep. You better. You Job, you know, it was his contention. Moses wrote Job. Uh, you know, but uh, Job 42, verse 12, uh, 14, right, says he had, uh, 13 says he had seven sons and three daughters. Now, this is an interesting thing. Find me the names of the sons in Job. Right? And he called the name of the first, Jemima, the name of the second, Keziah, and the name of the third, Karen Hapuk. Well, that's Egyptian. That's an Egyptian name. That's not Hebrew. I mean, anything Hebrew about that. And so, it's why you point this out. Well, you've got chunks of Ezra and chunks of Daniel. Basically, half of Daniel's written in Aramaic. That alphabet that this is written in was actually uh, they took the Aramaic alphabet and adopted it in the Hebrew language. If I were to put uh, what's called Proto-Hebrew up on a page, most guys that can read a Hebrew Bible couldn't read Proto-Hebrew because the, the styling of the lettering is, is so harshly different they would have a hard time. And so the influence and the relation of Hebrew and Aramaic goes way, way back. Aramaic is actually probably the original Semitic language. The Semitic language has three main branches. Aramaic, Hebrew, and Arabic. And Aramaic is actually probably the oldest of the three. And so when you come to the scripture, if you have the time to study a lot of, of uh, ancient, ancient history, going back to the dynasties of Egypt and, and uh, Mesopotamia and all that, um, you'll find that the amount of cultural overlap 
in the Old Testament is, is huge. There's a lot there. And, uh, and so when, when people try and pick fights on this stuff, uh, you know, let me ask you, what's the number one Mexican song that most Americans can sing the first couple lines to, even though they may not be able to speak any Spanish? Thank you. La Cucaracha. <laughs> la Cucaracha, La Cucaracha. And they go, la, 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 la Cucaracha, La Cucaracha. Right? Right? Nobody, nobody, most people don't know what the rest of the words are, right? But they can hit that. Okay? And then thanks to Freddie Fender, Feliz Navidad. Yeah. Feliz Navidad. Right? They, they forget all the other words. Yeah. What about French? What's the number one French song in America? Frere Jaca, Frere Jaca. Now you say, how come people can do the French one easier than they can the Spanish? Because it's the only time French is slow, you know, and you can understand it. So, so we have these overlaps even in our own culture. <clears throat> what one work of English literature endured, but it's actually Anglo-Saxon in origin. What well, one work of English literature has endured, but it's actually Anglo-Saxon in its linguistic origin. Starts with a B and ends with a wolf. Beowulf. Beowulf. Most English speakers can't read Beowulf. Most English speakers can't read Chaucer. Chaucer's Middle English. And he said, why do you point this out? Alphabets evolve till they reach a terminal point. Some alphabets actually drop some of their stuff. Uh, you know, I'm sure you know, Sister Elena, uh, Spain, they've gotten rid of the double L and the double R. Mm -hmm. So there is no more A or L. It's not there now. You know that it's pronounced, but they went on ahead and dropped it from their alphabet. So in the last, you know, 15, 20 years, one country has dropped part of their alphabet. Does it change the meaning of the language because you pull out something of the alphabet? Does it change its functionality with the people who speak it, read it, live it? Does it make the slightest bit of difference if I spell the word tonight, N-I-T-E, or N-I-G-H-T? No. Still has the same meaning. Same thing. So when people come to some of this stuff and they make a big deal of it, um, they only do it on the Bible because they have 10,000 other things in their culture right now that they don't make a big deal of but they'll make a point of it where the scripture is concerned but the ancient uh, but the Old Testament is predominantly Hebrew and Aramaic with some Egyptian names and words in there and, and logically so um, how long were the children of Israel in Egypt Four hundred years. You understand Ephraim and Manasseh. Those those boys were named off of Egyptian heritage. There wasn't there wasn't in Israel when those boys were named. Okay, so we we'll come to the New Testament. In the New Testament, now most of the New Testament was written in Greek, but there's parts of it where they speak Aramaic. There's parts of it where it's Hebrew. There's entire phrases that are the Hebrew parallelism. And I'm still a believer that the Gospel of Mark was written in Latin and that it was preserved in Greek because the Greek in Mark is nowhere near as fluid as in any other book of the New Testament. Um, <coughs> and, and when you go to the cross of Jesus, what languages was the crucifixion designation written in? What does the scripture tell us? Greek. 
Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So it was written in Greek. What else? Hebrew. And Latin. And so, <clears throat> so if you ever see on a crucifix the letters I-N-R-I, that's Latin for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. You know, there was no letter J. The letter J is a very recent invention. Um, that, so, Yesu is the I. Judea was spelled with an I in Latin. Uh, Nazareum. And then uh, the word for king uh, is, uh, we get in Spanish, reina. Uh, we have our English word reign. comes from the Latin uh, rexum. You know, uh, so... Uh, you know, all, all those languages. So when you start to look at that, you show me, this is a Septuagint, this is the Greek Old Testament, written in classical Greek. It's not the same Greek as the Greek New Testament, which is Koine. You said, yeah, I can read both of them. That's, I don't know books I can't read. I have a rule. I don't own it if I can't read it. And then this is the entire Old Testament, New Testament, Deuterocanon in the Latin. This is the fifth critical edition of the Vulgate. But here's the interesting thing. It doesn't really matter which language it's in because it's unified through all of them. It maintains the same unity even though it's written in different languages it's written across different cultures, across different centuries, across different empires, by different people of different educational and social status. It maintains a consistent message no matter where and no matter what. That's it's, part of its inspiration. I believe that is a huge testimony to its inspiration. Every other religious text is written in predominantly one language only. And they can't maintain consistency. You know, the only reason, and I'll just say, the only reason the Quran is consistent within itself is because one guy wrote it in 23 years, and then it was locked down within his lifetime. If you only have one language and you can write your religious text in 23 years, I would hope you could keep it consistent with itself over 23 years. You know, and the Quran's about the same size as the New Testament. You know, so. That's the, only, that's the only one that's a major religious text that's, that, that's basically consistent within itself, but it was written by one guy in 23 years that was locked down by his followers as soon as he died. And as we're going to see with some stuff with the Old Testament, the fact we even have an Old Testament is a witness to itself. You go to early writing styles, this is an Arabic alphabet. This is a Hebrew. This is Syriac or, or uh, very close to the Aramaic. And then the Greek, different letter values. Obviously, our alphabet comes off of the Greek and the Latin. Um, you know, but that's when you, when you want to see what you're looking at. But look at the similarities, just generically speaking, right? An A makes an A, a B, G, D, H sound. He said, well, that's epsilon. Yeah, those Greeks messed it up, <laughs> right? You end up, you know, with, with that W, with the Z, again, with a, with a hard H sound. Very similar in its phonetics. Now, why would you have similar phonetics across multiple languages, even though the languages aren't the same? Blending from languages from people working together. Okay, that's one idea. We're all using the same physiology. Okay, same physiology. But at the Tower of Babel, what did people's tones already have the sounds and the shapes of? You know, so when you confuse the language, everybody left with languages. But there's only so many sounds you can make. There are only so many sounds you can make. And so, 
It's this, I mean, that's just one of those kind of, to me, that's one of those just little interesting things. But let's look at materials. Clay tablets. Uh, let's go on ahead. We'll read Ezekiel 4 1. Because I could tell you that these verses, you know, say this stuff. Okay. But unless you're going to take pictures or take notes and go home and verify it, I can tell you that it was made out of moraine. <laughs> and throw a scripture up there. And unless you go home and check it, you're going to go, I didn't know the scripture was written on moraine. <laughs> and, and we've reached that stage anymore. I still remember as you're turning, Catherine and I, we were, we were visiting somewhere. We caught this mega church's early service. Their 8.30 service. Because the Lord's church didn't kick off till like 9.30 or 10 in that place. So we figured we'd go catch it. I want to see what a church that has 40,000 members. I want to see how they do business. And uh, the preacher got up. And because it's in this book. And I would never say anything to you that's not in this book. And then he said all kinds of things that weren't in the book. But because he held it up and used it as a prop. He did a beautiful tactic. Of public speaking and slight hypnosis it's a form of induction he got everybody to agree to this that this was the standard and he kept holding it up and they put it and I wouldn't say anything that doesn't agree with it amen brothers and sisters and as soon as they said amen he was free to say whatever they want and they transferred and thought you transfer by thought that every word that came out of his mouth had to agree with the book because he prepped them for three and a half, four minutes. Form of, uh, form of uh, hypnotic induction. That's what I say to you. Take any notes I put up, take pictures of it, take home, check it. Why? You say, brother, you wouldn't mislead us. I wouldn't intend, I would not intentionally make a mistake. Could I make a mistake though, put a wrong reference down? Yes. Yep. Can I get far enough ahead of myself in my thinking that I forget to read the next verse that says I'm wrong on what I'm thinking? Yes. So we always want to check each other. Someone read Ezekiel 4.1. You also, son of man, take a clay tablet and lay it before you and portray on it a city, Jerusalem. All right. So clay tablets used to write on Ezekiel's commanded by the Lord to take it. Now stone, we won't look up stone. What's the big, what's the most well-known thing that was ever written on stone in the, in the history of the world? Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Remember, there were two sets of Ten Commandments on stone. The first set, God cut and God engraved. And then Moses, he had some anger management issues. And some violence issues. So after he smashed the tablets and told his kinfolk, put on your swords and let's go through and kill these rebels. Then the Lord said, now cut your own tablets and come back up here again. And so Moses spent the night cutting his own tablets. And then the Lord was kind enough to re-engrave them. What went into the Ark of the Covenant? A pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the stone tablets. But the book of the law stayed on the left-hand side in the Holy of Holies so that it could come out and be read to the whole assembly by the high priest. All right. So stone, we know that one. Precious stones, Exodus 39. Now who knows what these precious stones were? As you're thinking about Exodus, what were they probably? <clears throat> Something like that, something large. Okay. Oh, with the, for the breastplate. For the breastplate of the high priest. That'd be correct. <clears throat> so go on ahead, Kevin. You got Exodus 39 14? Exodus 39 14, yes, sir. Go ahead. There were 12 stones according to the names of the sons of Israel, according to their names, engraved like a signet each one with its own name according to the 12 tribes. All right. Now this, this would make a jeweler uh, go on edge. You've got Sardis, Topaz, Emerald, 
turquoise, sapphire, diamond, jason, agate, amethyst, beryl, onyx, and jasper, and someone <laughs> taking a metal tool and etching the names of the 12 tribes. And they estimate those stones were probably about, about the size of a business card and probably about half an inch uh, thick. So how much? <laughs> the high priest breastplate. <laughs> yeah, but the Lord says, yep, etch some names on it. Etch some names. Now, what does that really tell you about the value he places on the names of his people? The stuff it's engraved on is just stuff. But what was over the chest, it's supposed to be at the heart of the high priest, at the core of his being, but the names of God's children. You know? so, so God engraved what was precious to him on that which is precious to man. Animal skins. Animal skin, Second Timothy. If you've got it, go on ahead and read Second Timothy four thirteen. to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the last... 2 Timothy. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Ah. Well, 1 Timothy 4.13 is good, too. I'll try again. <clears throat> Thirteen. Bring the cloak that I left with carpets at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. All right, especially the parchments. The word for parchment is membrana. They had different ways that they could take animal skin, different thicknesses, different ways of curing it that made different kinds of writing materials. Uh, membrana is obviously, that's, that's one of your thinnest ones. Uh, frequently that was lamb skin. Uh, you could put more pages of it together and it was lighter. Um, but the history of leather and Bibles goes way back. Uh, it's not just, you know, <clears throat> I miss true leather Bibles, because what smells better than a brand new leather Bible? Man, hardly anything smells as good as a brand new leather Bible. And then papyrus, that's your books, that's your books. Paper, yeah, paper, papyrus, that's where we get our word paper. All right, and then metal, metal. We'll go back, pick up Job. Job 19, 24. Says they were engraved on a rock with an iron pin and lead forever. They said, How, what? how's that metal? Because what they would do is they would take and they would take a stone that was one color, they would etch it out with the iron pin, with that basically a chisel, right? And then they would melt lead and fill in so that you had the relief of the contrast so that it was easier to read as you went passing by. That's why all those blue signs on the side of the highway usually have white letters. Why? So you can see it while you're driving. This is the ancient version of that. This is the ancient version of that. So as you're looking at all these different things, and then what other one do I not have up here? But you know uh, that it was at least there. We already mentioned it with the crucifixion of Jesus. What other one material have we not mentioned? Wood. Wood. All right. So wood is another option, okay? So why are some manuscripts here and why are some not here? I'm gonna give you four areas to contemplate. And we'll just, we'll look at each one of them individually here. Materials. Will stone last for a while? Okay. 
depending upon what kind of stone it is, it can handle breakage fairly well, right? But how portable is stone? How portable? How portable? All right. There's a group out there that they started in Palmyra, New York, paused in Missouri, and they stopped finally in Utah, that they said their book was written on gold tablets. For the number of pages in their book, it would have taken three mule trains to carry the amount of the weight of gold. It's one of the big fallacies in that story. There's a reason why, very early on, they put all this stuff on leather, on, on animal skins. Okay? Stone's great, but it, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't carry well. Paper or papyrus, it's portable, it's long-lasting when dry. You get a little bit of bleed issues with the older ink, okay, because of how it was made and what it was made of, because most of it had some kind of oil with it. So you always have a little bit of leaching, and over time it can become brittle. Now, does paper still become brittle? Yes. Yeah. You know, when you handle great grandma's Bible from 1875, be real gentle with it. Because those pages that you go to fold, it may fold as it breaks in half. I've got a few, I've got a few Bibles from the 1800s. I'm super careful. Whole hand. And, and gentle lift. Um, so you have you have those issues. Animal skins, they're long lasting, they're flexible, but there's oil bleeding issues. The oil in the skin, the process left from the curing, plus the inks over centuries. Now, listen to what I just said. Over centuries, they react long term, okay? If you've been to see the Constitution or the Magna Carta, they're sealed. They, they're sealed. They've got the perfect humidity and all that, so they have been able to stop that. How many factors, though, to keep those documents intact? A lot. Uh, a lot. Yeah. You know, but they've as 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 short as the Constitution has been here, it had bleeding issues within the first ten years. So, clay. Clay is extremely long lasting as long as you don't drop it. The moment you drop it, just piece it back together as best you can, like a china cup, right? And so, and then metal. Metal is long lasting, metal can be portable. You can get metal super, super thin. Um, and then you have the oxidation and but then you also run into this issue of feasibility where price is concerned. You know, it's not cheap. It's not cheap. Environment. Water submersion. It's bad for biological material. As long as something stays in the water and never comes out, it's fine. The moment you bring it out, it starts to go to pieces. Um, Stone, pottery, some stuff's okay in water, some stuff's not. High humidity, you have mildew issues. I know no one in Florida is familiar with that. <laughs> and then depending upon, like with metals, some metals oxidize, some metals don't oxidize uh, very much. Dry, uh, you've got issues with brittleness, and then you've got issues with shrink and decay. An animal skin in a dry climate, over time, it will shrink. That'll cause blurring, it makes it brittle. You go to pick it up, it falls apart because you have to have that, 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 that suppleness. <coughs> Popularity. Now most of you don't know what the hand knocking uh, up at the top corner of the screen is. That was an album by this wonderful musical group called Kiss. The album was called The Elder. I've never been able to get the exact numbers at that time, every album Kiss released always went at least gold within the first 90 days. Okay, that was how much popularity and how much loyalty their fan base had. 
The elder was so bad, they pulled it after 90 days. I didn't know that it even existed because no copies ever came to my part of the world. And what few hit the Denver metro area, they were gone, and very few. They estimate less than 100,000 were actually actually sold, sold in the US. Popularity affects things. If a work is unpopular, what copies exist are generally well preserved because no one used them. You can find basically mint condition copies of the elder with the people who bought it that didn't throw it in the trash. And few, if any, original copies are left because it was unpopular. Okay? <clears throat> How many Pintos are on the road right now? A couple. A couple, yeah. You know, I hope they don't get rear-ended, right? I see them using the drag races. <laughs> yeah. What happens if something is popular? It's just bought and you don't. Okay. Original copies are going to be hard to find. Why? Because they're used. They're used. I have a couple Bibles that I finally had to quit using because I, I ran out of ways that I could continue to glue them back together. They're still my favorite Bibles, but I just, you know, I can only glue them so much and get the things to open right anymore. Um, you know, I remember at least three times be, before I left home that my granddad had to have new Bibles because literally they fell apart, all the pages came out of them. Because he would just sit and read the Bible after he retired. That's what he'd do six hours a day, just read his Bible and contemplate the Lord. You know, said, no, I don't want any of those. The only way to own them is put them in a Ziploc bag because they were all shredded apart. Okay? There are generally an abundance of later copies and editions, and it's almost always referenced in other works or other works are written about it about works that are popular. Usage, some texts remain because of contribution to larger culture. Massively popular texts have very few, if extant, copies in the first through third editions. Find me a first edition of Milton's Paradise Lost. I own one. I found one. In Maryland. I bought it. And someone stole it. I paid a pretty penny for it when I bought it. And I had a first edition of Gustave Doré's Woodcuts. Same person who stole my copy of Milton stole my copy of that. They knew what they were looking for. But the lady that I bought them from, she had gotten it the day before. I said, do you have any? And I named off a couple things I was looking for. She said, actually, it just came in. I haven't had a chance to really catalog it. I said, what do you want? She named her price. I said, here you go. Didn't have it. I mean, it was, it was about yay big. And it had those really cool boards for the, for the inside on the front and the back. It was absolutely beautiful. I said, no, that was the only one I've ever seen with my own eyes and held my hands. I enjoyed it for about three months. Okay. Now I've had chances to buy fifth and sixth editions that are still old and extremely valuable. I just don't want them. Because I had first. I had first. You know, very few of those. Later editions are more frequent. Just because something's later doesn't mean that it's not valid. Early editions that are intact were either not used because of contamination or corruption or because the people didn't think it was worth value. And you need to keep that in mind. You're looking at a world. I think I gave $60 for this 30 years ago. Okay. I thought that was a little bit high priced. 
because it wasn't lead. You know, if it had been lead, they're fine. You know, they should have at least put like thirty dollars on it. You know. But do you understand how rare it is that I've got my own copy of a Hebrew Bible? No one would have had that when Moses wrote it. There was one. One. You know, and that one was what they made copies of parts of it that they took to the different towns that the Levites and priests would teach people from. Not only do I have it, I've got it in this, and I've got it in this, and I've got it in this. If you have more than 20 books at your house, do you understand that throughout the entirety of world history, less than one, one millionth of one percent of people have ever owned more than 20 books in their life throughout all human history? We take for granted the existence of things like libraries. There's a reason why some of the ancient libraries are so well known. The library at Alexandria. Why? There's only library. In the There's only one in the whole of North Africa. And every scholar went there. How many places in America? What one guy did more to advance book reading in America than any other person? No. He did the catalog. How about Andrew Carnegie? Andrew Carnegie, Scottish kid from Angus, Scotland, came to America, U.S. Steel, became the richest man in the world. He would still be rated one of the richest men that have ever lived. He spent the first half of his life accumulating so much wealth that no one could challenge him. And then he and through his wife, they built Carnegie libraries all across America in small towns and medium-sized towns that didn't have enough money to have libraries and then helped stop them. So, you know, us being able to just walk in someplace or get on the internet and go, I think I want to buy 30 books this month. You couldn't do that 400 years ago, 200 years ago. You couldn't do it. Okay? So when, when you say, no, Books were so valuable. They used them. They didn't leave them sitting around. They used them. You wear out what you use. When it comes to the Old Testament, and I know this, some of this is kind of dry, but when you come to the Old Testament, there's no manuscripts prior to the time of Ezra. Now, some people have an issue with that. I don't. Because the Scripture is unbroken. 2 Kings 22 and verse 8. I want you to see something. Right? There is this kid. Good kid. If he'd have just stayed home, he'd have lived a little bit longer. His name was Josiah. Josiah in the 18th year of his reign tells Hilkiah, hey, we need to put the temple back in order. And so verse 8, Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. And Shaphan went, the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servants have gathered the money that found in the house, delivered it. You know, and he said, We found the book. We found the book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Verse 10. It had been at least 60 years since anyone had cracked the word of the Lord in the kingdom of Judah. It had been sitting on the side of the altar and no one had bothered to clean the temple or read it for at least three generations until they found it under Josiah. So it was there in the time of Josiah. Daniel chapter 9. Now this one's the one that cracks me up. Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel's a couple hundred years after Josiah, basically. But, and, and, and I'm going through this because people try and paint this picture that all of the ancient Bible people were super primitive and that no one had anything. Uh, no, it's not so. 
It was limited, but it wasn't as bleak as they tried to paint it. Daniel 9, verse 2. Someone read that. Anyone. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. What prophet did he do 70 years from? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. But what did it say he had? I, Daniel, understood by what? The books. When they got taken away to captivity, guess what they took with them? The word of the Lord. That's why there's two Talmuds. There's the Babylonian Talmud. The one that they wrote as the commentary on the Old Testament when they were in Babylon. And then there was the Jerusalem Talmud. The one written by the Jews who didn't leave the land. The ones who went into captivity, they took their Bibles with them. They took the Old Testament scriptures with them. And Daniel, who was uh, a teenage boy when Jeremiah prophesied what he prophesied, now Jeremiah is in his 80s and he's telling the Lord... You said you'd do this 70 years ago through your prophet Jeremiah. He had all Jeremiah's prophecy. And then Nehemiah 8, 1 and 2 records where Ezra got up and he read Tyler, man, I don't know. Double check. For some reason my cord ain't plugged in tight or something. Ezra stands up and he reads the word of the law to the people in the land when he goes back. Reads the word of the law. Skip to this. My point there is this. They had the Old Testament through the captivity. They had it when they came back. Ezra and the scribes made it prolific. They made a lot of copies. And as the kids come in, in the 1700s, they thought they only had 615 manuscripts of the Old Testament from ancient times. Later on, a little bit later, another guy, he was able to find more. He cataloged 731. Then the Egyptians finally open up some of their stuff. All right. And if you study Egyptian archaeology, the Egyptians like to play games with the rest of the world on stuff. Okay. 200,000 manuscripts and fragments, over 10,000 of which are biblical, just the Old Testament alone. 10,000 plus manuscripts of the Old Testament. The Iliad and the Odyssey is from basically the same time as Jeremiah. I want you to see something. Of all of the stuff of the Iliad and the Odyssey, there's roughly 400 from the 18th century A.D. back to the year 750. 2,500 years, there's only about 400 manuscript of the Iliad and the Odyssey. But of the scripture... Before the year 100, there's over 10,000. Remember what we said last week? Do you know how many people go to colleges and argue that you shouldn't trust the Iliad and the Odyssey when you read it? <laughs> None. Even though it has less proof for it than the Old Testament. Remember what we said, the only reason that people get upset about the Bible is because it claims a right over our lives and tells us about a God that will hold us accountable. It's the only book that anybody worries about. Next week we'll move into the New Testament. So, we are glad you're here. We are glad you're here. Let's go with 2.2 out of the big book.
So we got a lot of things coming up next week. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, the Church of Christ over in Mayo is having a gospel meeting. Um, Tyler's dad is going to be a uh, guest preacher on Wednesday. Uh, the preacher on Monday and Tuesday, you might be familiar with him. You know him as Brian, your preacher. Um, so I'm doing the first two nights of the gospel meeting. Tyler's dad is doing the third night uh, over in Mayo. Thursday night is the uh, prison ministry uh, fundraising dinner uh, at University City. If you have not let Gary or Chris know, or if you haven't passed it on to me, if you passed it on to me, I've already passed it on to them. Um, but if you have not RSVP, please RSVP today or tomorrow um, at, you know, so that they can get the last part of that. Then Friday, we don't have anything scheduled. Then Saturday, September 24th, 6 p.m. Uh, is, is uh, uh, some singing. And, uh, and then there will be a smoked chicken dinner at 7 uh, at the Newberry Church of Christ. So uh, that flyer's been on the back for a few weeks. We want to make sure that we're pointing that out. So if you want to do something church-wise... Uh, next week, starting Sunday, you can hit six out of seven days <laughs> with only Friday. And, and if you go to the high school football game, you might encounter a different kind of religion. <laughs> you know, so uh, a lot of, lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff going on. Uh, do keep Brother Johnny in prayer. Uh, Johnny had gone to Windsor Manor. Uh, today he uh, went back to Gainesville. He's now at Shands. Uh, was having some respiratory uh, distress. Uh, you know, just trying to keep that fluid off. He's having a hard time. So I want to keep Johnny in prayer. Uh, Sister Judy Dutes is, is doing well, but continue to keep her in prayer. What other prayer concerns do we have that we want to be mindful of? Yes, ma'am. There we go. All right. Well, I was waiting to see if he's going to raise his hand. Ask for prayer. But we already know the answer to that. No. Uh, Brother Ronnie's uh, going in tomorrow. Uh, Got to be down there at, at uh, 6.30. So as soon as services are over, they're going to go on ahead and head out to Gainesville and just catch 30 minutes of sleep tonight in their car. Um, but uh, want to be prayerful for that for Brother Ronnie. Uh, Last, especially the last couple months, uh, you know, he's, he's had a lot of energy and, and breathing difficulty and just simple things kind of been wiping him out. And the last trip to the hospital, all the stuff they ran on didn't didn't show anything. So now they're finally in the process of elimination. So we want to pray for those hands that minister to him. We're going to go in and do some things, checking on his heart and and, and see, see what's actually going on with some of the other stuff and, and try and get it fixed fixed up tomorrow. So I want to be prayerful for that for Brother Ron. What else do we have that we need to be mindful of? All right. How much do you want me to say? Just generically for you? Okay. Sister Linda Belden, she got some different things going on. Uh, if you want to inquire of her directly, by all means. Uh, but uh, but her arm, she, she got her arms, you know, getting there. So... Uh, but she's had some other stuff come up, so I want to keep her in prayer. What else do we need to be mindful of? What you got, David? Uh, Hobo won't be here on Sunday, but he, because he won't be comfortable here, so I might stay home with him. Mark Rice is up real bad, so he's... He's preparing you because I won't be here. So prayers for David. Amen. <laughs> Amen. David. God bless Mr. David. That the Lord would set a gate on him <laughs> with what comes out of his mouth. That he'd think three times as hard before he says it. So we're praying for you now, David. Uh, 
You know, this past week, this past week was one of those who was happy and it was sad. Alabama with a field goal beat the Longhorns last Saturday. One point. One point. Say, brother, what does that have to do with God? And oh, that's well, it has a lot to do with it, Phyllis. It has a lot to do with it. Because, you see, people in Texas think that God only likes to hear their prayers first. Hmm. And people in Alabama think they're more righteous than anybody. But, you know, on, on, a, on a kind of actual serious note, though, I would ask us to be mindful. Are we as passionate about the Lord as we are about our sports teams? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Throughout my life, I've known people that could have the flu, dehydration, pink eye, and it'd be 40 degrees below zero with wind and blowing snow, and they won't miss that football game. But when I called to check on them on Monday morning because they missed services, brother, I got a tiny sliver on the edge of my pinky, and I just couldn't manage to turn the doorknob or start my car. It's too much. Please pray for me, brother. I will. I ain't praying for your pinky, but I'll be praying for you lukewarmness. Amen. You know, that you either get hot or cold because you go to the football game and be fine. We would ask us to look inside ourselves. Are we as passionate about the Lord as we are the things that make us mad, the things that make us happy, the things that make us sad? If not, let's work on bringing our passions to the Lord. Because if, if the church was as passionate about the Lord as we are the other things that we'll get in arguments about, what would change? And if you're here tonight, we're going to sing this song, Jesus. And why the Bible is reliable, it really, it'll get more exciting. The manuscript part is not always the most exciting part. But when someone says something silly to you, like, well, you know, that Bible's not trustworthy. It's been changed a thousand times. And you ask them, well, show me the thousand changes. Well, I, I don't know where they are. Mm -hmm. For you to be able to give an answer and say, well, there's this, 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 and this. Have you ever insulted the Iliad and the Odyssey like you do the Bible? Well, no. Because Psalm 222, there's something about that name. It's the only name that the devil fears. It's the only name in which man has hope. And it's the only name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. And that is the name of Jesus. And tonight, if you need to be baptized into his death, his burial, his resurrection, to receive forgiveness of your sins, will you come and always stand while we sing? Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance
Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can come together tonight and study from thy word, how it come about. And I just ask you, Father, to guide us as we learn from this and we'll be better able to show it to others and relate it to them. Lord, I ask you to be with Sister Belton. I ask you to give her strength, give her healing. I ask you to be with Ronnie tomorrow as he goes for his heart cath. I ask you to be with the doctors and the specialists that will be doing the procedure. <coughs> I ask you to guide them and help them to use their knowledge and do it in a way that it will be helpful and they will find out the problem and it will be corrected and all you be a better portion of health, Lord. We thank you for loving us and caring for us and we thank you for always being with us. And we just ask you to guide each of us as we leave tonight. Help us have a safe journey home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.